Thank, thank you, Danny. Thank you, and thank you all for coming today. I'm Jim Todd from R.W. Beckett. I am a technical sales and support leader with Beckett. I've been with Be the Becketts since 2006, but I've known them for quite a while. Uh, I guess much of my career I've known of the Becketts and been very fond of their product and, and glad to represent them today. So today we're going to go over the uh, conversion gas uh, power gas burners, um, something that's happening on occasion um, and uh, something that we want to keep in mind and, and do properly if we run into the situation where we have to get that last chance with a customer and convert something over to gas. So the presentation is designed to assist a trained professional like yourselves in the, covering the conversion of tested and listed appliances, fuel source to natural gas or liquid petroleum gas um, propane. This training should not be considered by untrained individuals as promotion to convert appliances without previous trade experience. That's the last thing I want to have happen. Do not attempt any of the steps shown in this presentation if you are not a trained technician. Personal and property damage, including fire loss or death, could be the result if you are not a properly trained technician. Upon completion of today's class, you should be able to perform an initial survey of the proposed conversion site and identify areas that must be addressed during the conversion. List the materials required to perform a conversion, prepare the appliance for the installation of a retrofit burner, size the gas supply for installation using the chart for the supplied fuel source, design the gas supply system to the prevailing code requirements, Identify components of an R.W. Beckett CG4 conversion gas burner. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Adjust the supplied gas valve. Commission the burner for safe and reliable operation. Perform final installation steps to meet prevailing codes. So what I want you to remember right off the bat is uh, the code books that are out there. And NFPA 54 is the National Fuel Gas Code Book. Um, it establishes the codes that will provide safe installation of gas appliances, as well as industry accepted methods for the proper installation and operation of fuel gas piping systems, equipment, and accessories. As a trained professional, you should have a copy of NFPA 54 for your reference and guidance. Contact the authority having jurisdiction before you start any of your uh, work especially a retrofit um, installation of a burner to ensure that you're, you're meeting the local code compliance because the local codes may change slightly. First things first, we're going to do an initial survey. You want to know how old that appliance is. Appliances have a useful life. Whether we like it or not, the customer may think that the useful life is forever, but they have a useful life. Stop and think if that appliance is over 15 years old. It may just not be worth changing out. They may be in a position where you put on a burner and the next thing you know, that boiler springs a leak and you're sit sitting there trying to answer up for why did I spend, why did they spend all this money for a conversion and now I've got a boiler that's leaking. Is it in good condition? Converting the burner is not going to restore the appliance. I don't care what the customer may think. Does the installation need an upgrade? Everything changes with age. I know I sure did. So don't assume you can simply change the burner and miss potential issues. With the electrical, I want you to check the electrical. Uh, you're going to need to upgrade it if it looks more like a bowl of spaghetti. There must be a proper overcurrent protection for the appliance, a stairway switch, a service switch, and a thermal switch may be required in many locations. Going back to that proper overcurrent protection, that appliance is supposed to be on its own circuit. If it's not, that in and of itself is a violation of the code, so watch yourself. The other thing we've got to consider is combustion air. Do you have enough combustion air for the appliance? And then you're saying to yourself, well, they installed the appliance. There must be enough combustion air. It must be installed in a location that provides adequate air for combustion. It may have been when it was first, would inst wasn't first installed, but is it now? 
you've all been around and long enough to have a boiler that was installed in a great big basement and then the kind the customer decided he'd run down to the local big box store and built a room around it and that's what you're going to have to watch out for measure the area you will need a minimum of 50 cubic feet of air per thousand btu input if you're drawing the air from that basement that is code know your options if there's not enough combustion air there are options available to you consider one of the following if there isn't enough combustion air uh, you may be able to get some openings to another area which provides sufficient air or to the outside with a high and low vent that's covered in um, nfpa 54. you may want to use a fan induced uh, combustion air uh, there's ones from journal and then from field a burner mounted air boots are available. Remember that incomplete combustion will create carbon monoxide and the lack of combustion air is hazardous. We need to do, we need to make certain we've got enough combustion air for the appliance, whether it's oil or gas. Inspect the chimney and vent. The chimney must be properly lined. Any accumulation of soot or debris in the chimney offsets must be removed before we get going. All obstructions, such as a protruding joint or broken tile wedged in the chimney, must be removed. No other appliance connection should be made to the same flue pipe. It should be just that one appliance. The flue pipe should have a quarter inch per foot upward pitch to the chimney. It should fit tightly, be secured, and not project into the chimney. Listening to all of these must do's makes you think, well, that might not be my area of expertise. You may wanna get a chimney sweep or a chimney professional in to inspect that chimney before you start the job. Draft regulation is another issue. We're always accustomed to that RC draft regulator that swings in one direction. When converting from oil to gas, though, the draft regulator must be either replaced or newly installed. It shall be a double acting type agency recognized for use with gas vent systems. An example is, and the picture's right there, a field's, uh, field controls MG1. It swings in both directions. A little hint if you want, there's weights that hang here. You wanna make it easy to set this up. Take a paper clip and put a paper clip here and drop your weights on that paper clip while you're setting your draft. And once you get it, then you can put the screw in place right through the, um, the discs for your weights. This meets ANSI 21.8, section five and six, and that's what we're trying to do. There will be a thermal safety switch that needs to be installed, and that's the beauty of a double acting barometric damper. Most codes and gas utilities will require the installation of a thermal safety switch on the double acting draft regulator or draft hood. We do call it out in our instructions, so that becomes code. You need to install a thermal safety switch. It is a recommended practice and provides the following protection. The thermal safety switch senses flue gas spillage caused by blocked flue exhaust prolonged downdraft or insufficient draft. And how does that happen? Well, this is a double acting barometric damper. Typically when you have draft, the chimney's drawing, that swings in and the, the air pulls in to dilute the, the draft, to break down that draft. When that chimney up here is blocked, the gases will come out of the appliance and spill out onto that spill switch. And that's when we're gonna shut off that burner. When the spillage of that hot gas is detected, it will shut off the burner. One question is, is it resettable? Yes, it is. Um, you can reset it down on the bottom. Uh, don't tell the customer. Chimneys and vents. The chimney must be lined. If you don't know, have someone check. Don't assume anything. Condensing flue gases can be corrosive. Minimally, the condensate will deteriorate those mortar joints, as the example here shows. There is a conduit for gases potentially sending hazardous CO into the house, and we don't want to do that. 
don't be tempted or foolish, always include the replacement of the flue pipe as part of your installation. If we look at the two examples here, we will consider the length. See what happened. I'm coming up and I've got a 90 here and up. I've got two 90s going into it. When I change that flue, I now have two 45s. I just reduced the developed length of that pipe by, 20, by 14 feet, which helps me ensure that I've got a good draft and a consistent draft. So look around. You may have some options there to really improve the performance of your uh, venting system and in so doing uh, improving the performance of your combustion because you can make it more reliable. You're going to need to clean that boiler. That boiler has been burning oil. We need to get the oil out of there. Clean that boiler well. When you're finished, carefully seal the cleanouts and the flue collector itself. And now here's the part that people get into and they kind of cringe. Replace that chamber material. No matter how clean the boiler seems, the chamber material will have residual oil byproducts in it. You will experience inconsistent combustion results as the oil byproducts react with the gas flame. Save some time and save some trouble. Change that chamber. You can buy chamber kit kits easily enough from your supply house. Make certain you include one in your bid. With the gas piping, Consult gas pipings for the type of fuel used. Remember, the volume of gas delivered to the burner is critical for safe and reliable combustion. Size the supply properly. Don't take any shortcuts. For our example, this is a net, we're going to use a natural gas example uh, application. And the example of the gas supply piping is Schedule 40. I know you guys are using uh, the CSST. Uh, I'm old, I'm still stuck with uh, black iron pipe and threading and fittings. The supply pressure in this case will be less than a uh, half an inch PSI, a half a pound rather, pounds per square inch, which works out to 14 inches water column. Consider this while you're doing it though. We've got a picture of an oil truck and a picture of my bicycle. The tire pressure on both of those are 60 PSI. Same pressure, but will the bike tire work on the oil truck? Of course not. The bike tires won't support the load. That's like an undersized gas supply. So keep that in mind when you're sizing your gas piping. What we're going to use to size the gas piping is the longest length method. We can do a variety of other things if you want, but let's use the longest length method. It's the easiest way and it works out for you while you're doing your bid. So here's a typical residential application. Follow the, uh, follow the following steps to size the supply using the longest length method. So what we'll do is find the longest run from the meter. Make a sketch and total the lengths. After adding the piping sections, we find that the water heater is 85 feet away from the meter. This is the longest lo run. So select the row according to the longest length. So I come down here for my pipe length and I find 90 feet. That's the row that I'm going to work with. Now I'm going to total up my loads. So my load is a dryer at 30,000 BTUs, a boiler at 140,000 BTUs, a range at 45,000 BTUs, and a water heater at 55,000 BTUs for a total of 270,000 BTUs. So now I'm going to begin with my first section. My first section is a total of 270,000 BTUs. I go to my chart on that column, the 90 foot column, and I find that 320,000 BTUs will be supplied by an inch and a quarter pipe. So that's what I'm going to start with, an inch and a quarter pipe. Then I go to my next section. I will deduct the dryer, which was 30,000 BTUs. So two set 270,000 minus 30,000 is 240,000. Again, it's too small to go to one inch. I'm going to go to an inch and a quarter pipe. Now I'll go to the next section. With that, it's 240,000 minus 140,000, the boiler. 
and I'm going to go to um, one inch pipe. Um, so I see that I'm down to 140,000. The circle's in the wrong spot. It should be right here at one inch. There's my 160. And finally, I'll get into that last leg, segment C through D um, is the range. That's going to be three quarter inch right here because I'm running 55,000. So I'm down in here and my last is going to be 50, 000, um, three quarter inch also. I'm gonna use a three quarter inch drop to that water heater. Just keep it at three quarter. So that's how we'll do it for the longest length. When we get into propane, uh, propane gas piping is discussed in a um, piece of literature that's available to you free online for download. It's our uh, part number 60034, Guide to Power Gas Burners. There is another code for LPG, uh, for, for petroleum, and that's NFPA 58. Uh, please consult NFPA 58 and consider in-depth training from propane experts who train using CTEP-based guidelines. Uh, propane is a different animal that CTEP classes, if you get an opportunity to take them, are invaluable. They're great classes to take if you work with propane. So I'm going to go with the longest length method, my first stage, and I'm gonna measure my first stage up. Section A, B, I take my load, which is 255,000 BTUs, and a two PSI allowable pressure drop. I will um, consult table four from my, my literature to determine the copper tubing size. I will calculate the adjusted demand. So I continuing with that table, I've got 255,000 BTUs. I'm going to multiply it times 0 0.707, or I'm going to have an adjusted demand of 180,312 BTUs because it's an intermittent demand. From the 50-foot column, select a capacity that exceeds the adjusted demand. In this particular case, 3 8 inch tubing. So my, from my first to second stage regulator, I should be able to do with 3 8 inch tubing. My second stage, I'm going to use uh, table six and only the 30 foot column. We're going with that longest length method again. Section B to C demands, uh, it has a 255,000 BTU demand, which requires a 7 8 inch copper tubing or three quarter inch pipe. Section C to D is the 255,000 BTU demand. Um, Well, I think I did that wrong. No, that's correct. It's 225,000 BTUs. I said it wrong. Sorry about that, guys. I threw myself off. 225,000 BTUs demand requires 7 8 inch copper tubing or 3 quarter inch pipe again. Section D to E is 125,000 BTUs per hour using 3 quarter inch copper or half inch pipe. Um, continuing on, section C one, that's my drop, is going to be half inch copper or half inch pipe. D2, D to two, is going to be 5 8 inch copper or half inch pipe. And section E3 is going to be 70,000 BTU demand, 5 8 inch copper or half inch pipe again. And then my water heater, is 55,000, which is half inch copper or half inch pipe. So that's how I'm getting that. So that's how the sizing works. I went through that fairly quickly. Please consult our book. Um, it'll help you out immensely. Typical piping layout for a CG4 is going to be a drop with a drip, a drip leg down below. And then I'm going to go into a um, main shutoff cock, then into a T for, um, so that I can test for a test cock, then a union, then I'm gonna go into my gas valve and then to my burner. What I'm going to do is make certain that my piping is all secured. Uh, and this is the from NFPA 54 and that tells you how to secure your piping. You're getting closer to the point where the oil burner will be removed and replaced with a gas burner. We've got our piping in place. Um, I'm ready to remove the oil burner. 
It's time to discuss the oil tank. Why? Well, because if there's no other oil-fired appliance connected to it, that tank now is considered out of service. Time to reach back and consult NFPA 31, which covers the oil equipment, the standard for oil burner burning equipment, and see what they say about an out-of-service tank. If you go to uh, Chapter 7.12 of NFPA 31, that will cover tank abandonment. Simply stated, if a tank and its related piping are abandoned for whatever reason, the tank and all piping connected to it, including the outside fill and vent piping, and any piping connected to the appliance shall be emptied of all contents, cleaned, removed from the premises, or property and disposed of in accordance with all applicable local state and federal rules and regulations. Here's why. And here's a basement down here and here's a horror story that comes to us from ABC7 down in the uh, Silver Spring, Maryland area. A fuel delivery company mistakenly dumped around 250 gallons of heating oil into a basement of a Silver Spring home causing a nightmare scenario for the vacationing homeowners and their basement tenant. And I quote, it's a combination of errors, end quote, a person briefed on the hazmat incident told ABC7, quote, the driver goes to the wrong house. It turns out the house they go to used to have heating oil, still has the hookups, no longer has the tank. They pump it in, there's no tank to catch it, and it just flows like water. Many municipalities now require that the homeowner notify in writing, uh, notify the oil company in writing when they have a conversion. You may want to check your local codes before you complete your bid for installing the job. You may be responsible if you do not follow the code. Remember that. And that's a very expensive goof. So now let's look at the CG4 burner. The CG4 burner is designed on the AFG chassis. So if you're familiar with the oil burners, you're looking at it and you're saying, boy, that looks like an AFG, and it should. We have common parts there to simplify setup and service. Uh, the common motor here, the fan inside is off an AFG. Uh, this J box here is off the AFG. We're using the shutter and band on the other side, just like an AFG. You will find with the CG4 that you get robust and reliable flame characteristics. It really is a nice setup. To make certain that you're running it safe and reliable, we give you listed appliance applications, and that's by us to ensure safe, reliable conversions. We don't want anybody hurt. We don't want you to get into trouble. Use our guides. If you look at the CG4 to see how it goes together, You'll see that it's very easy to install. We have a pre-assembled air tube that is matched to the appliance with a welded flange so that you know the insertion depth and you have the proper head assembly on it. One trick I'll warn you of when you go to put it in, if you look over here, you're gonna see a couple of screws right there. They're holding the gas gun assembly in place to the, head, to the air tube. You have to take those out before this will go in and then you will install, reinstall them right here in these two holes once you get finished. So don't throw them away. I made a fool of myself a couple of weeks ago helping somebody else trying to put the air tube in, and I forgot to take those out, and it wouldn't fit. And I finally said, okay, dummy, take the screws out. Life will be good. It is specifically designed to meet a tested application, and we've done those tested applications for you. Those tested applications are listed in our approved of application booklet, which is also found on our website. The CG4, if we look at it right here, has improved air regulation for some applications by installing either the blank band, which you see here, or the typical slotted band that you're accustomed to from the AFG. It's easily installed in the field. What you're going to do is take the air proving switch off. It's held in place just like the pump would have been, and then pop off the shutter, loosen and pop off the band, and then put the right band in place. 
We will provide um, the band. Uh, it is provided with the, for the tested application with the welded air tube and flange assembly. So if you don't see one, it wasn't supposed to be on that installation. As far as doing the rate on it, rate is um, the the gas valve assembly can be installed right or left-hand gas entry. The rate is regulated by supplied orifices that drop right into the gas gun right here. There are two tested orifice packs included. Um, we'll set it up so that you've got enough orifices to do natural gas and propane. You will make your choice for natural gas or propane by installing the correct orifice as listed on, in our installation um, guideline for you. Select the proper orifice based on our listed application for the fuel selected. Just drop it in. You've got a gasket that's going to go there and the gas train assembly will screw in place either left or right hand entry as I said before. That's that picture of the orifice. That's where it's gonna drop in. This is the gas gun assembly showing you the flame rod rectification here. And this is the arc, the sparker, this is the electrode here. Some applications will have a, a, um, a uh, the baffle in it, the, um, yeah, I'll be all right. I'll get back to that in a minute. Rate control is key to a successful installation. That's the one thing we wanna watch for. The Beckett Power gas burners are designed so that you can make adjustments to the rate anytime you want, not just when it's commissioned. That's the nice thing about it. This is the static plate. That was the, that's what happens when your mind is over half a century old. The CG4 uses the F head, as you can see here, uh, the fixed head, and it has a shroud around the outside that gives you robust, reliable operation, and it makes it easy for you to set up. They are going to be matched together. The flame rod rectification combined with our 7590 control provide reliable flame sensing and service. And the 7590 control makes it easy for you to know whether or not you have a good flame signal. It'll tell you, there's a yellow light that will come on. If it's on strong, you've got a good flame signal. If it's winking at you, you've got a weak flame signal. Time to clean the client, time to clean the rod, the flame rod. As far as air adjustments, the air adjustments are done in the same fashion as the AFG and the AF, and also the SF or the SM. Both shutter and band. There's both a shutter and band for air adjustment. The scale is cast into the, the chassis itself. The way you'll set it up is by loosening the air proving switch first before trying to adjust the air. So we'll loosen up the air proving switch here, then we can loosen up our screws for the shutter, and then we can loosen up our screw for the band. Once you get finished, I want you to tighten everything back up again when you get finished with it. The proper gas valve in installation, I'm gonna review this because we need to remember it. Make certain that you ream and clean the inside of the pipe and nipples to remove any burrs and chips. You're going to apply pipe sealant to the threads, leaving the first two threads bare. If you're tightening the valve, use a smooth jawed wrench on the valve body. Do not apply pressure to the body as shown up here with somebody grabbing it. That's Paul Bunyan grabbing onto it. and He's going to thread that on with his hand. You're going to break it. Just don't do it. As far as adjustment goes, we're working with a White Rogers gas valve. It's a 24 volt gas valve. The inlet supply pressure must be less than 14 inches of water column or you'll lock it up. The nice thing about the White Rogers is if it does, if you have that Homer Simpson moment and if it goes over, typically it will release once you set the pressure properly. Regulating gas valve pressure adjustments are made by removal of this screw here that's the regulator cover screw, and then we'll turn the final adjustment here. We will check our pressure using this outlet pressure tap, and um, that's where we'll go when I'll put my manometer in there. Commissioning the burner is our next step. Refer to the appropriate specification guide 
and set the air, gas pressure, and head settings for the listed appliance application. This is that book that I've referenced in the past. It's available again online. It will be in the packet when you get the burner. Check and confirm orifice and head size or position. Turn on gas supply, purge, and leak test by an approved method. That is not a lit match. You're going to do it accordingly. Ready the area for a combustion test. So now we're going to commission that burner. So what I've got here is a furnace or a boiler, and I'm showing some different ways to install my breaching and my chimney connector going on. Drill a quarter inch sampling hole as shown in the illustrations. So here I am on this breaching here. I've got a sampling hole right here. It's going to be two pipe diameters, if possible, from the breech or the elbow. The breech or the elbow, depending on how I've done it. I want to be one pipe diameter, if possible, away from that draft regulator. Why? Well, the gases coming out of that appliance are going to be turbulent. They're going to be very, they're going to be moving along in a fashion that is far from laminar. I want to make certain that I'm catching the gases properly. If I've got this wavy supply of breach gases going on there, I don't know where I'm sampling until I can get something that's laminar. And that's what I'm looking for. I want a laminar straight flow. The reason I want to stay away from that draft regulator is I don't want that draft regulator to spoil my combustion. I may have some gas, some air coming in here and it may come back and affect my reading. I want to get a proper reading of this. Continuing on, start my electronic analyzer. You should start your electronic analyzer outside, folks. That's where it's supposed to start, not in the basement. And I'm the first one to break that rule. I will start them in the basement also, but we're supposed to start them outside. Why do we do that? Well, we can check for carbon monoxide as we come into the building to make certain that it's safe to work there and it's safe for our customer. Confirm fuel selection on your analyzer. Make certain that your oxygen reading is uh, somewhere around 20.9 to 21% on the analyzer and make certain that the analyzer is showing zero parts per million CL. If you have, and they all do have them, some sort of filter on there, you want to make certain that the filter is clean. Uh, if you've got a Testo with the little cones in them, pop the cone out and make certain the inside is clean. You don't want any carbon in there, otherwise it's going to throw off your carbon monoxide reading. And the carbon monoxide reading is going to be critical for us while we're setting up a gas appliance. So now off we go. We initiate a call for heat. I want to adjust the draft or breach pressure to the appliance manufacturer's recommended level after that flame has been established. Typically that breach pressure that does not exceed a negative 04 to a negative 06 is generally acceptable. When we get into the three pass boilers, we want to get the three pass boilers probably between a negative 02 to a negative 04, somewhere in there. Measure the carbon monoxide level and adjust the air settings to temporarily raise that carbon monoxide to about 50 parts per million for a test point. That's where we want to be. It's, if you've done a four-step combustion test on oil, you know that we're changing things to a trace point. That 50 part is the equivalent of trace for us. Now we're going to open the air adjustment to increase the oxygen level by at least 1% or to 3% oxygen, whichever is higher. This should reduce the carbon monoxide level and provide a margin of reserve air to accommodate variable conditions. Sample the CO again. It should be in the range of zero to 20 parts per million CO. Recheck the draft readings. Remember, make certain that your, your stack temperature is high enough to prevent condensation. Uh, typically, that's somewhere around 320 to 350 degrees. That should be sufficient for you. Continuing on, you need to verify all limits. We want to check that boiler control limit to make high limit to make certain that the boiler shuts off. 
I want to simulate a loss of flame to verify flame safety. That's easy on that white Rogers control. There's a switch on top that has on and off on it. Just turn it to the off position. That's what one of my friends does. Every time I go to start one of these burners, he will reach down and switch it to the off position and I will stand there like a goof trying to figure out why I couldn't get the burner to light. Uh, thank you, George. Low water cutoff uh, control, if the low water control is installed, you wanna make certain that the low water cutoff is working. Now, if we're working with natural gas, I wanna clock that meter. And we give you instructions on how to clock the meter in that booklet that we've got, uh, which is the guide to the installation of a conversion burner. Verify and record the input. During your final steps, you will find that there is a contractor startup form in the back of the INO manual. You may want to take a copy of that before you start the installation. You should complete that startup form that's found with the burner literature pack. Fill in the hang tag. There's a hang tag in there and a conversion label that is supplied in the literature pack. That, that is consistent with the ANSI 21 code. Label the appliance where it can be seen by the next technician. Attach the hang tag so service information is easily found and recorded. Congratulations. You've just finished the conversion of your customer's equipment. What a great professional job you've done. So let's get ready for another challenge. If you need more information, please visit us at BeckettCorp.com. You can also contact us by email by sending questions to techquestions at BeckettCorp.com or you can call our dedicated call center at 1-800-645-2876. If you want a quick and easy way to remember that, it's 800 oil burn. Thank you all, I appreciate it. Please visit our virtual booth at, e at the Triple E. We look forward to getting your name in there and look forward to answering any questions that you may have from us. So on that note, thank you. And Danny, I'll turn it over to you for questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Nicely done. I think we got a little echo there, Jim, but that's okay. Um, so everyone, uh, thank you for again for, for uh, participating in, in the webinar today. Um, it is time for questions now. Um, and uh, so please feel free to send along your questions. We've got a, we've got a good 15 minutes or so uh, dedicated to uh, or left for questions if you if uh, if, if necessary. So uh, either one of two ways. Uh, you can either raise your hand, use the raise your hand option on your uh, go to webinar panel or uh, send through the question and then I'll unmute you uh, so that you can um, so that you can ask your question, okay? So we got a couple notes here coming through from Robert. Uh, let's see here. Okay, Robert uh, had a note here about uh, checking with A A A H J, uh, and also uh, about uh, low water cutoff. Uh, would you like to uh, ask your question? Sure. The, the local authorities here require that the boiler be brought up to current specs. So if it's 20 years old, be prior to the time period that a low water cutoff was required, or a backflow preventer. Um, anything on the boiler has to be brought up to spec. They're going to inspect everything. Just wanted to throw that out there. I found yeah, that the hard the first time. Yeah, thanks, Robert. Yeah, that's that's not uncommon. That's not uncommon for the um, authority having jurisdiction, the HJs. Cool. And now's your the, here's your bite at the apple. You should do it. You should bring it up to the code. I know one thing that people run into. Um, and I hate to say it, but I ran into it in my own house, is um, clearance to combustibles. Um, you know, I just took it for granted. I, you know, I've got a fireplace in the vicinity of my furnace and I forgot about it. You know, there's a big slab of cement up there and I saw the big slab of cement. So I figured I had enough clearance to combustibles and a buddy of mine came over and said, uh, how come you don't have some way for clear for uh, 
to reduce your clearance to combustibles there, um, you know, maybe a plate of metal or something. I said, well, I got the concrete over there. He said, look up. And I did. It ain't there. So we had to make a, we've got to make a pan to put over it at some point. But it has to be done. You got to bring it up to code. Robert, you had Thanks, a, another comment. You had another comment regarding the uh, the burner itself. Um, I don't know if you want to uh, share that with the audience. Yeah, I just want to tell you guys, it's been a great experience with it. We've installed a couple dozen, and I've never been back on a single one. It really is a great product. Zero problems. Excellent. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, sir. Not a single service call. Probably cut at least a couple dozen over the last four years. It's awesome. Cool. I, I was out on one the day of the, um, we got the hurricane around here, and I was out um, supervising the installation of one. It was a case where the customer had a thousand gallon tank, oil tank, and uh, the new buyer of the house said, get it out of there. But they had a, a fairly new appliance in there. And um, that was the change out. They, they switched it over to propane. Um, and they ended up pulling the thousand gallon tank and they put in a, put in propane tanks for it. So, you know, sometimes it helps the customer out. You know, sometimes, that, many times that cost of a, well, you couldn't get an oil tank in this basement. I mean, I had a hard time walking in the basement. I don't know how they got the boiler in there. Uh, so it's 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 a good opportunity. Well, that's been a good product for us anyway. No problems whatsoever. I think the fact that you limit it to certain applications is really the trick. Where everything's yeah. already knows you know it works before you even start. Yeah, yeah. Everything was tested out in Ohio. The boys did a nice job with them. Are, yeah. are they adding any more applications? I haven't looked in quite a while. Um. No, I don't. I don't know whether they have or not, Bob. To be honest with you, um, I haven't been over a year. Yeah, I, I'd have to check with. I know who to check with. I'm not going to mention his name now because he'll come after me, and he <laughs> won't with happy faces when he comes after me. But yeah, it's, I'll have to check. See if we've done any more applications. Thank you so much, Robert. Uh, yep. Thank you. All right. Uh, there's a uh, Mr. Todd. There's a Mr. Butler that raised his hand. Uh, Mr. Butler, would you like to uh, would you like to chime in? Yeah, I just wanted to get back to uh, Bob and anybody else. Uh, if you have an appliance or an application that you'd like us to to try, we're more than happy, and we have the uh, we have the ability. We have a lot of appliances here in inventory that uh, hopefully we can get the work done fairly quickly. But yes, we we like to know where the burners are going. That way, when you get the burner and put it in, uh, minimal problems. But thanks again for your kind words, Bob and Jim. Great presentation. Craig, you, you may want to say who you are so people don't think you're just some oh, dude. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Craig Bayer, I'm a residential burner product manager here at Beckett. Thank you, Craig. Yes, thank you. All right. Uh, before anybody uh, leaves, I uh, just want to make sure you uh, you download the presentation slides. They're available in the handouts tab on the GoToWebinar control panel. So make sure you uh, grab a copy of the PDF um, before you leave. A um, couple more questions that came through here, uh, Jim. Uh, the the first one is. The chimney has an eight by eight tile liner. Is it okay for a conversion burner? Uh, well, is it okay? Uh, you're gonna have to check with the AHJ, but in my eyes, it's not, it's too big. Um, um, if, you, if you take the, the uh, effective opening of that, you've got 64 square inches there. Um, if your boiler's got a breach of six inch, it's gonna be 29 inches that it's looking for. Seven inch is gonna be around 39 and eight inch is gonna be about 50. So you're, you really got an oversized chimney there. Uh, it should have probably been, convert, uh, been um, lined earlier for the oil appliance. Um, you wanna make certain that you get, get the chimney lined appropriately and to the appropriate size so that you can take care of any condensation that may occur and ensure that the customer has a good draft. So is it okay for a conversion burner? 
uh, I'm not going to say yes. I'm going to say no. You really should. You really should line that and get it down to the right size. Does that mean that you're going to? Well, your AHJ may allow you to do it. So my recommendation is that you line that chimney. All right. Uh, another question popped through here, uh, Jim. Um, my customer has an older boiler that looks like it is in good shape. You don't list a burner for it. Why don't you have a way to use your burner for conversion? Well, I think I think the comments that you've heard beforehand should answer that. We're looking for success. We want you to be successful, and we are looking for your customers' safety. Uh, we want to list. We we want to install our burner on boilers and furnaces and water heaters that we have tested, so that we know that it's working properly, that you've got the proper insertion depth, that you've got the proper rate on it. We don't wanna play any guessing games out in the field. Um, that's why we use a welded flange. I know there's been some complaints about the welded flange. They're looking for a, a, a flange that's not welded, sort of a universal flange, adjustable flange. Um, we're trying to take that, take that problem out of the equation. That's why we're using the welded flange. Uh, we're looking out for you and your customer, so. All right, another question, this one came through during the presentation. Uh, can I install your burner on a boiler with a power venter? You can, yeah. I, I did one early on in the development of this product. Um, I did a boiler up in Bennington, Vermont with a power venter. And I, you gotta remember, everybody says, oh, a power venter, a power venter is, what's a power venter? Power vanner is a mechanical chimney. Uh, if you set it up properly, that's all it's doing. It's 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 creating the draft that a, a chimney would create for you. Now you're going to set that power vanner up properly. You're going to have to use a draft regulator on it. Um, I would still recommend using a double acting draft regulator. The uh, control kit is going to shut it off if the pressure switch says it isn't working, but that doesn't mean that there couldn't be a problem there. So let's go with a belt and suspenders. Um, and we'll put in a pressure switch with a, uh, excuse me, we'll put in a um, double acting barometric damper with a spill switch on it so that the spill switch is hooked up to shut the burner down in the event that the power venter should go bad and the burner continues to operate. So yes, you can, you certainly can use a power venter. They do work, they work well. They need to be maintained though. Uh, that's the big tripping point with power venters. They need to be installed properly and they need to be maintained yearly. You're supposed to check that chimney yearly when you're doing a cleaning and make certain that that chimney's all right. You're supposed to have a mirror and look up, make sure the chimney's clear. Same holds true with a power venter. You've got to check that power venter and you've got to oil it. You've got to clean it if necessary. So, but yes, you can, sure. Cool. Uh, the next one here, Jim, is the last one that came through. Um, says, I don't see any furnaces on your list of tested appliances. Does that mean you can't get your burner to work on a furnace? No, we can get it to work on a furnace. Um, it's really a, a case of economics. If you start look, if you start putting the dollars together on a on a conversion burner and everything that's involved with a conversion burner, you're approaching the cost of a new appliance when you're working with a furnace. And you're not you're doing the customer a disservice by not changing that furnace. Um, there's gas appliances out there that are pretty darn thrifty to operate and they're fairly inexpensive to purchase. Um, that's why we didn't go with the, the furnaces. Um, you know, there are some furnaces out there that you can talk to Mr. Butler with, and, and we certainly could uh, give you an application for them if you, if you wanted, that are more robust and uh, they might be in a commercial application or an industrial application that you don't wanna change. Um, but when you get a house like mine, you know, I, I've got a 75,000 BTU furnace in here now, I can change that furnace out for about the same price as doing the conversion gas burner, a little bit more and I have a new burner and I'm running 
you know, that'd be running probably around closer to 90% efficiency as opposed to the efficiency that I had with my, the furnace that I've got in the house right now. So that's why we didn't do it. Uh, hope that answered the question. Let's see here, just a hand up. Uh, Craig, did you wanna add anything to that? Oh, sure. Um, just to reinforce exactly what Jim said, uh, a lot of times the economics don't work out. However, you know, you may have, I don't know, a development or something, a, a large number of a certain furnace in your customer base. Uh, if you send us a request, we'll certainly take a look at it. And uh, there's absolutely no reason why the gas burner won't work. On it. As a matter of fact, the warm air application would probably be a lot easier than a lot of the boilers we've applied these to. So it's, uh, it's certainly a something that is doable it's just that so far the economics have, have not worked out to jim's point so but thanks for the question great all right everyone looks like uh, we've addressed the questions that have come through uh so again i want to thank everyone for uh coming and hanging out with us for a little bit today and, and partaking of this uh of this last webinar. Um, as Jim mentioned earlier, uh, this was the fourth one that we did in conjunction with um, the Eastern Energy Expo. Uh, the other three are available on demand. Um, so if you didn't get a chance to register for those, you can still go back and register for them. And then uh, you'll have instant access to the video of the webinar and the Q&A and also the slides uh, from the presentation. So please go back and uh, Take a look at those if if, uh, if you'd like. Uh, we also have a couple of additional training sessions that are coming up uh, that you can find through BeckettCorp.com. That's our website. Um, and uh, over the next couple of weeks, um, and a bunch of additional uh, training sessions that are also available on demand. Um, just register and you'll have instant access to those materials as well. So uh, again, before you leave, make sure you uh, download the, uh, the presentation slides. And um, uh, thank you very much for, for uh, participating today. And um, we look forward to seeing you at a future Beckett online training session. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you all.